Kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui ki a koutou. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and for the, really, the opportunity to reflect um, on what is such a really important topic with so many aspects to it. So even the preparation um, of thinking about what to say has, has just been a great opportunity, so thank you for that. Um, back in, the, also in the 1970s, Colin, um, uh, my job as social sciences librarian at Dunedin Public Library included filing the New Zealand government of documents that arrived in huge bundles every week. The bills, acts, regulations, order papers and gazettes. We were a depository library, one of about 20 around New Zealand responsible for making all parliamentary documents publicly available. It was time consuming work doing that filing but critically important as a resource, as there were very few places where the public could access this material or get help to use it. And people use this material for all sorts of reasons. The customers I remember are those wanting to check out their rights, such as tenants, beneficiaries, consumers, neighbours or prisoners or wanting to inform themselves as taxpayers, beneficiaries, consumers, uh, or no, as taxpayers, voters, activists, or new settlers. People would read bills and royal commission reports in order to make submissions. Sometimes they would write their submissions on the public typewriters provided by the library. Certainly those typewriters were also used to prepare CVs and job applications and write letters to government departments. Now it wasn't until 1989 that the law required local authorities to make their agendas, minutes and plans directly available to citizens via libraries and council service centres. It took a bit of persuasion to make this a reality, but once in place, the same motivations and patterns of customer use applied. And our role as a public library was to help people understand how to use these resources and assist them to find the answers they were looking for, given that there were no indexes. Quite often, we would supply contact details for MPs and ministers or point people in the right direction to speak to someone in a government office which still existed in most locations. So why did public libraries do this? It goes back to the core principles of why public libraries exist. The right to know, freedom of access to information, freedom of expression, equity of opportunity and access, the right to participate fully in a democratic society and ensuring that people have the skills they need and are assisted in to learn those skills. In my view, all of these things add up to the rights of a citizen. Now here we are in the digital world, considering how libraries enable digital citizenship. And so what's different? Quite a lot, actually. E-government, both e-local government and e-central government is now the norm and on track to achieve high percentages of interaction online over time. Probably not as fast as you would like, but we're on track. The degree of self-help information seeking is also now growing rapidly. Things that were complex are now really easy, uh, like finding legislation using keyword search or finding contact details. And interactive, participative democracy online is extensive and encouraged, and levels of participation are probably much higher now through submissions, surveys, feedback, requests for service, discussion forums, social media, all supported, of course, uh, through libraries. All of this is good for local and central government, I think, and certainly good for citizens to be able to exert more direct influence. And I think the fifth flag option uh, is an example which was largely a Facebook campaign and a fifth flag was added to our referendum uh, options as, as a result. 
But e-government assumes access to a device. It assumes a degree of digital literacy skill and confidence. It assumes awareness of what is going on. It assumes that people will participate online. It assumes that the virtual world is sufficient and that local face-to-face -face is no longer required. It assumes that people own telephones. It assumes that people can afford telecommunications costs. And the worlds of education, commerce, entertainment, and particularly employment um, assume the same. So these days, you look for jobs online, you apply online, you provide CVs and references in PDF online. You have to be contactable by email. If you want to come along to a free tutorial, you register online. When those assumptions are wrong, then gaps occur with the very real risk that people are excluded. And this is where libraries have a key role to play, I believe, based on that fundamental premise of ensuring equity of access and opportunity, plus our innate customer service response of helpfulness and kindness, to quote Nigel Latter from his Monday keynote at the Lianza conference, and also, I think, our skill in identifying and knitting many threads together. So libraries' experience is that we now deal with fewer citizen-related inquiries and that the range of inquiries is narrower because of the extent of online access and content. However, the inquiries we do receive are more complex and more time-consuming and require a greater degree of staff assistance. So how do libraries support digital citizenship? What is the equivalent of what I used to do back in the 1970s? So firstly, we offer extensive networks of public computers plus Wi-Fi access. At Auckland, thanks to the vision of our elected representatives, we are able to provide this free of charge to ensure equity of access. But not all public libraries or local authorities are able to afford to do so fully and those charges can become a further barrier. Secondly, libraries offer digital and information literacy skills classes to various degrees for groups and one-on-one -on -one tuition. We promote, promote major local and central government consultation processes and try to make it easy for people to participate and prepare submissions using library computers so, for example, we bookmark key local government and e-government sites where there are um, referenda or consultation going on, or we highlight these on our web pages. Next, we help people make connections with people and agencies they need to talk to. We provide space for voter enrolment and special voting. During the last central government election, uh, there were long queues of people waiting to cast a special vote at some of our libraries in Auckland, to the extent that closure of some of our libraries was delayed by up to two hours in the evenings. So maybe there is something for the Electoral Commission to learn from this, that hard-working, busy people want to vote, but at times that actually suit them. We help people get jobs. I was spending um, time at one of our libraries recently when a customer rushed in 30 minutes before closing in a great rush and great anxiety. He had just had a job interview and now had to digitise and email through a PDF copy of his references. He had already been using the library regularly to check seek to find a job, uh, to learn basic computing skills, to set up an email address, to get help with CV writing, and to submit an online application. Next day, he came back with the good news that he had secured that job. Like thousands of others, uh, Work and Income New Zealand had referred him to a library to do all this, to help prove that he was looking for work and therefore either get a job or retain a benefit. We also support people who really don't know where to start. One of the characteristics of libraries is that we get to know our customers and we encourage staff to do this, especially with children and young people. A couple of years ago, the staff at one of our libraries noticed a young man, a regular customer over many years, looking really depressed. 
So they checked in with him and discovered that he was keen to enrol in an arts course at Manukau Institute of Technology. However, the obstacles facing him seemed insurmountable. Um, he needed a tax number, a bank account. He needed help to apply for a student loan and he needed a driver's license. All he had as a citizen was a library card and a school ID. The library staff helped him work out who to contact and how, and they used their community networks to find people who could help. As a result, he enrolled in the course and has established a strong future for himself in this field. And multiply that by the thousands of young people that we connect with every day. That connection happened because of the high levels of trust that people place in libraries and librarians. That young man would not have had the courage to seek help from people he did not know. He probably would not have gone alone to a government office or to a community space full of computers, but nothing else. So another e-government risk is that we stereotype and make assumptions about the people who aren't able to access e-government services directly. It is easy to, to assume that they are largely elderly and therefore lacking skills, or poor, and therefore don't have computers at home. And to assume that once these two things are addressed, as people age and computers become cheaper, then the need for public libraries to be in the mix will disappear. But libraries' experience is that the people who come to libraries to participate and exercise their rights as digital citizens are as diverse as our whole community. It is assumed that young people have the necessary skills, but this is not necessarily the case. Even in households that have their own computers, it is not untypical for some people in that household to have limited access, women for example. Have you heard the joke that the closest some women get to the home computer is to dust it? Our research shows that very few young people in South Auckland have access to a smartphone. Large numbers of new settlers face language barriers that library staff can help with. And not everybody has the necessary bandwidth to their homes to participate. An example is that last year, Auckland Council consulted on its draft unitary plan an immense document that contains um, layers and layers and layers of GIS maps and everything. Um, it's an extraordinary piece of work, but the file sizes uh, were massive. So this was a consultation that was going to happen primarily online. The file sizes were massive, and many residents, even from the wealthiest suburbs, had to come to libraries to view the documents there, both online and in print. So we organised clinics in their libraries with the planners present at certain times to help. But the problem for libraries was that our own bandwidth was inadequate, so we were often working from non-interactive CD-ROM versions, which is tough if your computers no longer have CD drives. Now there's another aspect of citizen support which I believe is important. In the early days of libraries, it was common to have lecture halls where all manner of worthy topics were debated as a form of entertainment. So they debated science and education and politics. And today, in a virtual world, we are sensing a new interest from our community in getting together to learn and debate. And we are reinstating the idea of libraries as places of active public debate. At Auckland, we have hosted discussions on gay rights, the treaty, environmental issues, censorship. We have developed programs for rainbow youth, including workshops for young lesbian women about image and identity. Um, we cop a bit of flack uh, for this from the community, and it certainly causes some unease within our own council as to why we are doing this and potentially affecting the reputation of council but we are a public library and that is our role and that is where we are loud and bold and courageous, I think, in terms of this slogan. In addition, we use all manner of social media to publicise these activities and uh, we re-record re the discussions in order to make them available online to a wider audience. And what about elections? 
libraries have typically avoided any involvement in elections in order to maintain absolute impartiality. But now we are changing our thinking, especially as voter awareness and participation dwindles. Auckland Council is undertaking an awareness campaign to improve voter turnout in the lead up to the 2016 local government election. And as part of that campaign, we hope to use libraries as places where candidates can display their publicity material and meet um, voters on the basis that this opportunity is allocated fairly to all. We are also considering how we can create social media spaces where candidates and voters can engage. It's possible that it is more acceptable for a library to do this than core council because it fits more closely with a library role as a neutral space where we support the rights of all points of view to be heard and um, often undertake displays and debates on controversial topics with their own disclaimer uh, associated with that. So the statements of the New Zealand Library Association and international library associations about freedom of speech and freedom of access to information all support this approach. And so we are thinking about how we might engage in that election um, publicity in social media. In my personal view, supporting digital citizenship is a core public library role. It always has been, it always will be. Times change and it is up to libraries to respond to the customer need and meet that need. So there is no reason for libraries not to engage in the e-government world as much as we possibly can. And I believe we have a responsibility to do so. But there are lots of issues and challenges in this space. How do we move forward? How can we do this better? In particular, how can central government and public libraries work more together to support each other to achieve our common goals? What can we do to help citizens get the expert advice they need? Libraries provide access to information, not to advice. It's an important distinction. Could we work more closely with local and central government to bring experts who can give actual advice into libraries on a regular basis, for example, by scheduling WINS clinics or the clinics with city planners? Secondly, what can be done to help smaller local authorities and libraries um, that struggle financially and have to charge for internet access, therefore introducing further barrier, or where there is simply lack of staff resource to meet the growing need from the customers. What resources and what help do they need? Do they need extra staff? Do they need help to deliver um, digital literacy um, programs? How could that be funded? What can we do to get the massive bandwidth that will be required in the future into public libraries? We have already had the example of the Auckland Unitary Plan, but young people, for example, make very heavy use of vis visual images and film to learn, yet it is far beyond a library's ability to provide the quantity of downloadable film and sound that will be required. This lack of ultra-high speed connection means libraries might not be able to provide access to the wide range of information and opinions in all formats that citizens will require in future, especially in a world where media and government sources may be less trusted. Is there a way that public libraries can be given um, the same priority for ultra-fast broadband plus plus uh, as schools and universities, and how might this be funded? Finally, how might we all progress this conversation together? I don't know how fast the world of digital content and online engagement with government, central and local will evolve, or what proportion of citizens will be able to participate easily and confidently in that virtual world. But what I foresee for libraries as their role in digital citizenship in future is ensuring provision of access to objective information, assistance to access information, skills building, building a sense of identity and belonging and cultural awareness, and provision of a place, both physical and virtual, where connection, debate, participation, and information sharing can take place. All of these things confirm the fundamental role of a library as the agora, the forum, which is at the heart of democracy. Kia ora.